Hello, hello, welcome, and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. As ever, I am joined by my co-host Joe, and we're both very excited to have a very special guest on the call with us today as well. On top of that, we have some new music coming your way courtesy of Lazy Days, so stick around for that too. But back to our guest, and his career in professional football began on Tyneside via Johannesburg, South Africa, where he hails from. After making a name for himself at Newcastle, he moved on to Norwich City, before returning to his home country with Mamelodi Sundowns, where he was managed by the legendary Christo Stoichkov. After a few more years with a couple of other clubs in South Africa, and now with some Bafana Bafana national team caps under his belt, the northeast of England came calling again, and several spells in non-league football later, today's guest finds himself as the academy manager at Gateshead Football Club, as well as being an elite performance coach for the Dugout Football Academy. We welcome Matty Patterson to the United Mates Football Podcast. Matty, it is a pleasure to have you as our guest. And how are you doing today? Yeah, pleasure to be on. Thanks thanks for having me. Um, yeah, very, very good. Just, uh, you know, happy to be on. Happy to, to still be, obviously, coaching. Like I said, I spoke to you before we came on. Obviously, during the pandemic, it's been tough for a lot of people, but I've still managed to be kept busy. And, um, you know, it's been a bit of a blessing in, in disguise for me, uh, being able to carry on as as normal, which um, I'm, I'm happy about. We're happy to have you. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the coaching that you're getting up to these days, as well as a little bit on the background of your football career. Joe, my co-host, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Kai. A few, a few technical issues today, but we got through it, so that's good. And it's been a sunny couple of days in London, so that's um, that's always good too. Um, but yeah, Matty, thank you so much for joining us. And when um, whenever we have a guest on our podcast, we always start um, by asking an icebreaker question. So um, we've got an icebreaker question for you. And uh, the question is, um, given that you, um, you probably would have been playing for Newcastle during the filming of that iconic movie, Goal. So our question is, <laughs> what is your favourite sporting movie? And I'll, I'll just give you mine first. So mine's probably Mike Bassett, England manager. I love that film. And um, I actually could have been in it is a slightly bizarre fact. But um, how about you? What is your favourite sporting movie? Well, I certainly wasn't goal, um, <laughs> put it that way. Um, I, I must say, Mike Bassett's up there. Uh, it is one of my one of my favourites alongside, I think, Mean Machine. Oh, um, good one. Another classic, I think. But yeah, definitely Mike Bassett's up there. Yeah, I mean, you can't look beyond Mike Bassett, but maybe you can. Kai, what's, um, what's your favourite sporting movie? As I sit here with my dog alongside me, if he if he pipes up, just a heads up. It's not me making dog <laughs> noises. I do have a dog. But on that note, it's got to be Airbud World Pup, which was the third Airbud installment. It went straight to VHS, although I did some research and apparently it did briefly screen in cinemas across the Philippines, which is good to know. Um, but basically, long story short, there's this dog buddy who plays soccer to help the Timberwolves. Of course, they would be called the Timberwolves to win the state championship game. And then the same dog buddy ends up going in goal for the U.S. women's team in the World Cup final against Norway and helps them bring home the trophy with a winning save in the penalty shootout. And of course, that's all based on a true story. <laughs> but uh, moving on from things like dogs playing in goal to some proper football and taking things all the way back to the start and focusing on your childhood, Matty, what are some yeah. memories you have of growing up playing football in South Africa? Yeah, there were um, you know great memories. I started playing from such a young age. Um, you know, I was kicking the ball around from well, three, four, five year old, and um, my parents were both originally from from the northeast of, of England, so they emigrated out to South Africa. So you know, for me, it was it was always going to be football that that I sort of started playing, opposed to what which a lot of people ask me why didn't I play rugby or cricket? Um, you know, so my dad was eager to get me into football straight away. Um, I think it was when I was six years old, I started playing for my first club out there, um, a club called Alberton Juniors. Um, and it just went from there. I loved, loved football. Uh, it was a really good standard out there, which also surprises some people. Um, you know, and I, and, I, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I was really focused, you know, from such a young age and, and, and probably knew then towards just before I came back to the UK when I was around 10, I knew it was something that I, I wanted to pursue. Um, you know, that, that was just a sort of natural progression. You mentioned your parents being from the Northeast, obviously growing up in South Africa, where you mentioned there's a good standard of football, but otherwise I presume you might have been watching some European football on the TV. Did you have any favourite teams or any inspirational footballers that you could model your own game on? 
Yeah, like I said, my parents being from like, from Newcastle area, gated area, um, you know, my dad was a massive Newcastle fan. So, you know, that was bred into us from a, from a young age. Um, you know, so like you mentioned there, when, when we were in South Africa, it was, you know, the Premier League so big over there. Um, you know, and, you, and you, you can watch, you get more live games out there than you do back home in England um, on the TV. So we were constantly watching games and, you know, it, I always remember it was the, it was the time when Newcastle were, were at their probably at their best under Kevin Keegan, you know Alan Shearer, Les Ferdinand, um, all them Peter Beardsley. Uh, so they had a fantastic team, you know, and I and I and I loved watching them. Um, especially Peter Beardsley he was an idol of mine growing up. Um, loved loved uh, the way he played, uh, how how good he was technically. So you know that I had some really good memories out there watching watching football and. Um, yeah, and, and and obviously taking taking a lot of that on on board from such a young age. Well, um, Matty, obviously you, you grew up in South Africa, and like you said, when you were about ten um, years old or so, you actually made the move back to the northeast. And you fast forward a few years, by the time you're about fourteen, you would actually go on to join um, the club that you essentially had grown up supporting. So, what is the story behind, um, I guess, how Newcastle scouted you and then would ultimately um, sign you? Yeah, so when I when I came back, um, it would have been 1998. I came back. I would have been 10, 10 nearly 11, I think. Um, and it was a case of I, I actually went to go and play for the boys' club that my dad used to play for when he was, you know, when he was a kid. It was a, a, a boys' club called uh, Regif Regif Boys' Club. Um, so I went there, uh, started playing local football, um, you know, and and again just sort of fitted right in. Um, you know, I was always under the impression coming from South Africa where I, I thought it was a good standard. I always thought coming to the UK, the holy grail of football, if you like, I thought, you know, I thought it was going to be such such a, a better standard, which I wouldn't say that it wasn't, but, you know, there wasn't a lot of difference between between there and South Africa. So, you know, I was, I was pleasantly surprised and, and I'd done really well. So, um, you know, it's... I had, I think, I had about two or three years at the club, or maybe two years at, at, at the boys' club, and then it was a case, like you said, got scouted um, and went on a six-week trial to, to Newcastle um, at the time. And then after the six week, had done really well and, and scored in a couple of friendly games, and then signed. And that was that was that. Um, you know, obviously from then on, I think it was under 14s when I joined. Uh, I, I would go on and, and and stay at the club until obviously leaving to go on to Norwich. Exactly. And I mean, you know, it's a impressive moving to a new country, getting getting into your boyhood team. It's all great. But obviously, um, as an academy player, I know you did um, suffer some setbacks as well, in particular in the um, 04, 05 season. I know you suffered some, um, some you know, some nasty knee injuries. So as, um, as a young player, Matty, how... Um, how challenging was it really to cope with these setbacks and did it sort of, yeah, how, how, yeah, how did it physically and I suppose mentally affect you at that age? Yeah, it was, it, it was tough because I remember I played my first game for the, for the first team uh, around about that time. We had played in a, in a pre-season friendly game up at, up at Celtic Park against, against Celtic and um, that was my first taste of football under, under Sir Bobby Robson. You know, um, I think I got about 20 minutes in the game and, and, and loved it, done really well, you know, on cloud nine, came back and, you know, just from being at the academy the previous week, it was it looked like I was going to join up with, with the first team sort of res and then reserves full on a full-time basis. Um, so I sort of jumped the gun pretty pretty quickly, um, you know, and, and within that same week, like you say, they, I had a just a freak, a freak incident in training, twisted my knee and, and ended up doing my ACL. You know, and going from from the hype of of that, you know, just playing my first, get my first taste of 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 the of the big time, um, to then basically going back with the academy again to do to do a long nine months of 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 rehabilitation for my knee. So um, it was a tough time, um, very very tough mentally. Within that time, I, I lost my my dad due to due to cancer, which again was was a, was was really tough mentally, and you know, I had, I had to find some real sort of strength from from within myself to try and get get over these these periods and these setbacks but um it's obviously something that i that i did um you know obviously and came, came back again and done the same the same knee same injury within the first game back um you know again was it was it was another test of character uh, and mental strength and you know once 
once that happened, I did fear, obviously, for my football career. And um, lucky enough, you know, I was promised a, a contract when I returned, obviously, and and they realised my knee could sort of I could I could get a run of games and, and be be completely fit fit again, um, which I did, which was which was great, and you know, obviously went on to to play for the first team then. Yeah, it sounds like a real crossroads that you found yourself at after those injuries and the unfortunate passing of, of your father as well. So it's very even more impressive that you were able to salvage a fantastic career afterwards. But moving on to something a bit more light, we do actually have a bit of a game or a bit of an activity, I suppose, set up. And sticking with, uh, with Newcastle a little bit with the theme of the tune. So Newcastle have had some notorious hotheads, you might say, down the years. We chatted with um, Warren Barton about that, you know, Keegan, I will love it moment. Um, Warren's namesake, uh, an ex-magpie, Joey Barton, was always a bit of a feisty character too. And of course, who could forget the infamous Lee Bowyer and Kieran Dyer fight on the St. James's Park pitch during a Premier yeah. League game. So the name of the game is Looney Tunes. And Matty, you don't have to stick to just Newcastle players, but what we would like to know is who's making it into a five-a-side team of your craziest ex-teammates? Ex-teammates? Ooh. Um, firstly, I would have to go for um, Emre. Emre was a feisty character, uh, Turkish, Turkish player who was who was fantastically gifted, but you know had a real short temper, um, and actually had a, had a had a falling out with Joey Barton one day in training, and it, and it came nearly came to blows. So I'd have to throw Joey in there as well. Um, you know, he was always a, a he was a feisty character, but also Joey could was a good wind up. Um, so, you know, he, he had a good mix of, of things going on. Um, uh, ex teammates, I'd have to go. <laughs> Nicky Butts, Nicky Butt was a, was, he was quite, quite a hard case. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have liked a, a clip of him. Um, that's for sure. Uh, Mike Lowen, people don't realize was, was, a, was, was handy with his, he could, you know, he was, I think he was a good boxer. Um, he would often get on the on the on the speed bag in in the gym, and you know you could see he had some he had some moves. So you know I think he could have done some damage. Um, yeah, I think Lauren Robert was was a bit of a, a feisty character as well. I think you know he could he could fly off the handles from time to time. So I think I'd have to say him as well. So we got four, is it, or have I lost track? Was that Barton, um, Emre, but Emre, and then just now you've said Lauren Robert. Lauren Robert, and then I'd probably say Lee, Lee Bowyer as well. Mike, well, I said Mike Lowen, Mike Lowen, and I'd oh, say Lee Bowyer as well. Um, you know, Lee Bowyer like a tackle, and he could get feisty at times as well. So I actually got a sixth out of you there. We got a six aside team, and presumably, I guess uh, Joey Barton's probably the captain, just by default, probably. <laughs> yeah, I thought Joey, I always liked Joey. You know, I said he, he had he had a good a good character. Um, he liked to tackle, and, and he and he could also he could mix it up, and he could give a bit of banter, which was which was good. Well, I mean, it, it sounds like a feisty team. I'm not going to lie. I'm sure it'd be. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd want to face those guys in my five or side league. But um, we see we've spoken about the loony teams, but let's talk about um, your time at Newcastle United a bit more, Matty. So I know obviously you played in the pre-season game in the 0405 season under Sir Bobby Robson, um, but unfortunately injuries sort of put pay to that season. However. In the next season, you would go on to make your debut for Newcastle. And then over that season and the next season, you would play um, for Newcastle a few times in the Premier League. You'd play in Europe as well and um, in cup, <laughs> cup competitions too. So you played across all the, all the board, really. So I guess what I'm interested to know is at the time when you're kind of playing for Newcastle United, are you are you taking are you taking it in the way a fan would and it, you're kind of going, wow, this is amazing? Or is it at the time... Are you, are you simply, you know, you're just focusing on one match to the next and just really trying to get the minutes in? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's surreal, I think, because I was a massive fan growing up, um, and I don't know when you when you're in there every day, maybe it becomes it just becomes it becomes a bit of a novelty where you don't you maybe take it for granted a bit. Uh, you you lose that sort of. You know that I wouldn't say you get a bit starstruck, but you you lose a bit of that when you spend every day with players that you know that a lot of Newcastle fans would get starstruck if they've seen, um, especially the likes of Alan Shearer, like I said, and Michael Owen, uh, who are big names, um, and obviously a few more as well. But you know, it's 
<coughs> spend, obviously spending time with it with, with 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 all those players is fantastic, and you learn so much as a player and and as a person. Um, but you you do you do lose a bit of that, you know that that love for the club and that and that real fan in me, which which I I don't have anymore. Um, you know, I'll always keep an eye out for the results and um, and see and see how they're doing. But uh, yeah, it's certainly something that, that sort of slipped slipped away a little bit. You know, when I when I was a player. Sure. No, that makes sense. I guess when you're um, when you're there on a day to day basis, it kind of it changes the the relationship with the club, and it ultimately you know you're it's your job as well, and you're focusing on playing for the team. But um, I guess um, another question I had about Newcastle is whilst obviously you achieved a lot at Newcastle. Is there anything that you didn't achieve there that you wish that you had? I would probably say that um, uh, it's, it's, and it's something that I always, I, I don't always reflect on, but it's, I probably, I would have expected myself to do a bit better than I did. <laughs> I think as a, as a young player, um, you know, the type of player that I was, I was, I, I like to think of myself as, as quite a, a technical player and, and, and quite creative and, you know, I, I don't think I, I showed enough of that at the highest level. Um, you know, whether whether that was, I don't know whether maybe I, I'd I'd found my level or you know it was a mental thing. Maybe obviously you throw fans in the mix and you know and and the Premier League and what it all means. Then you know does it you know is it is it something that I could maybe I didn't I I couldn't cope with. I don't know. But certainly looking back on it now, um, you know I always done okay. I wouldn't have said that I that I played I played bad. Um, but I certainly would have liked to have imposed myself more on the games and, and been a bit more effective. Um, you know, my first game for the, my first start for the club was, you know, I played really well and you know I, I enjoyed that game, but I don't think I, I probably performed to that level again as, as a Newcastle player. And that's probably something that, you know, that I do think about at times and think, I, you know, if I had took a bit more risks in the games and, you know, got on the ball a bit more and not played as safe, you know, that's something that I certainly reflect on on now. Well, before we move on to your next move to, to Norwich, on, um, on a more sombre note, we sadly lost the late Glenn Roder recently. And of course, Matty, you played under him at Newcastle and then he would bring you over with him to Norwich as well. So I'm curious to know from you a bit about the type of guy that Glenn was and also perhaps what type of an impact he would have had on you and your career. <coughs> yeah, he had a, obviously had a huge impact on my career. Um, probably I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know whether I would have went on and done the things that I did if it wasn't for him. You know, you get it. You get a lot of a lot of players that that have that one manager that you know, I wouldn't say looks after them, but tend to have a really close relationship with. And I wouldn't say close in terms of like you know being parley with him, but he did seem to take a shine to me. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when I when I done my knee for the second time, he had came in as academy director and. And he was the one that, that pulled me in and said, "Listen, once you prove your fitness, there'll be there'll be a contract there for you." Um, you know, and, when, and then when he got the job, obviously when Graham Sooners left and he got the job as a caretaker, um, you know, he he took me straight up with him, uh, and you know, on, on a full time basis, you know, that was the end of the academy, and, and I was in with the first team every day. Um, you know, and he's the one he's the one who gave me my my opportunities. He put me in there. Uh, he took, took obviously took a risk, took a gamble on me. And you know, I I done okay for him. And then obviously moving on to Norwich, it's just something that, that seemed again a natural, a natural progression for me. I wasn't playing a lot under Sam. And um, you know, Norwich were in a, in a, having a bad time in the championship. And and you know, once once he got he asked me to go, it was a, a bit of a no-brainer for me. Well, sticking on Norwich, and you went there on loan initially before making the move from Newcastle permanent. And this was kind of the first time in your career that you were consistently getting games in senior football and uh, you even managed to score in the old farm derby against Ipswich during your time at Carrow Road so what was it like moving from a football mad city like Newcastle to a more quiet place like Norwich and do you have maybe one standout memory in particular from your time with the club that you could share with us? <coughs> um, yeah so like you said there you go from from a massive football city like like Newcastle um, but then, you know, N Norwich is what people don't realise is they think it's a lot quieter, which it probably is as a city. But the, the football mad is also there. You know, they Carrow Road is, is sold out every single home game, you know, 27, 28,000. 
So probably not on a, as big a scale as Newcastle, but certainly, you know, the same sort of passion for the club and, you know, the supporters love the city. Um, you know, they've got the great rivalry with with Ipswich. And, you know, for, for me, I, like, like you mentioned there, the, the fact that I was playing every week, especially when I went on loan, um, you know, it was just what I needed at that point in my career. You know, the championship was, it was a good level for me, um, you know, and... And it was and it was an opportunity to go and have a, have a run of games and and I, and I did that and and you know we, we hit the ground running at Norwich uh, Glenn obviously Lee Clark went there as well you know I came a little bit later and we and we had a really good spell up until up until the new year when when I decided to 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 sign permanently but um, you know Norwich was a bit of a different feel I, I went from a dressing room that was very multicultural at, at Newcastle at the time you would have obviously you have your 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 bulk of, of English or British players in there, but you'd have a lot of foreign players where going into Norwich, it was very much a, a, an English dressing room and, you know, the players were a lot closer. Uh, you know, they would socialise a lot more and I, and I really enjoyed that that sort of vibe at the club. Probably a bit too much, if I'm honest, um, you know, but uh, certainly, I, you know, I felt at home and, and, I, and I really, really enjoyed my time there um, and was, was thrilled to, to go and sign permanently. I well, know it's interesting, Matty, because obviously, like you said, you enjoyed your time at Norwich and, you know, you were playing great football and obviously the fans love you because you scored in the derby, which is always a great bonus. But in um, 2009, so I guess a year before um, the 2010 World Cup, you made the decision to to go back home to South Africa and, yeah, join the, the Mamelodi Sundowns. Um, so from your perspective, how much of an advantage did you see um, playing in the South African domestic league would be in terms of like getting into the, the national side? Was that kind of the thinking when you made that move? It was definitely in, in, in my mind. Um, I think the whole move came, came around very quickly and it, and it was a very impulsive decision for me. Um, Cause again, once, once Glenn left the club, uh, Brian Dunn had, had came, took the manager's job, uh, you know, as a guest caretaker. And, you know, my game time became limited. And as a young footballer, I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I sort of, uh, yeah, it was definitely an, an, an impulsive decision. It, was just, it just came very, very sort of sudden. And I spoke to an agent out there and, um, you know, it was, it was the, 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 the money was good, it, it, but, it, but it was probably a rush, a rush decision. My, my wife, we had just recently had, a, had our first uh, first daughter. Um, so, again, there were so many factors involved with the move. But, you know, like I said, I'm very impulsive. And when I made my mind up, I'd made my mind up. And um, so I decided to go out there, obviously, with in the back of my mind, thinking about the World Cup. Um, I hadn't been back to South Africa at, at this point. So I didn't know, you know, what, what I was going into. Um, and it was uh, certainly a, a shock when I got there, and a big culture shock uh, from a football point of view. Uh, but within within a year of obviously with the World Cup being there, within a year of of, of that, you know, you've never seen such a change in a you know in a, in a country and in, in, in the infrastructure, stadiums, everything. Um, you know, within a one year period, it was just unbelievable how, how things changed. And you know, from sort of from then, I, I I think I'd done five five or six years. I think I'd done in South Africa and. You know, if it wasn't for my family back in the UK that never moved over, I would have, I probably would have still been there now. Um, you know, I loved it that much. The football was great for me. You know, the the weather, the climate, everything was 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 a was a pleasure. Um, such a great country. Um, you know, and I was a bit disappointed to come to come back in the end, but obviously, family's more more important. On that note of 2010, and you know, the momentous World Cup for South Africa and for all all of Africa. Um, you, at the beginning of the year, make it into the 29-man provisional World Cup squad for Bafana Bafana. The tournament comes around and, you know, you, you haven't made the cut. So what is it like witnessing and observing, like I said, this momentous World Cup that's on your doorstep, but from the outside? Yeah, well, fun, funny enough, once I didn't get into the this, this squad, I actually came back to, to the UK and got married that year in 2010. Um, so I spent a lot of my time back home in, in, in Gated um, watching the World Cup, but I did manage to get back from, I think it was from the quarters onwards. So, you know, it was such a, such an unbelievable atmosphere. Um, you know, everything like the, the fan parks, the, you know, the games, the stadiums, the atmosphere around the city, 
um, you know, it was phenomenal. Uh, like I said, I've never never seen such a change in a in a country. Um, you know, obviously when I first went there, you could see that there were starting uh, things were starting to come, you know, come to, sort of to fruition. The, the stadiums were being built, etc. Uh, but yes, from the World Cup, you know, it's it's left a massive legacy in the country and. Um, you know, and certainly for for you know for positive reasons. Um, yeah, everything. I mean, what what an incredible legacy! And um, yeah, we 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 spoken about that World Cup previously. And I mean, the the Shabalala goal in the opening game is obviously iconic as well. Um, great celebration as well from the the team after that. But um, but um, I guess obviously, whilst I imagine on a personal level, it was disappointing to not be involved in that tournament. You would, of course, um, still go on to play five times for the national side um, for Bafana Bafana um, and obviously you mentioned previously that living in South Africa was something you really enjoyed and potentially if it wasn't for family reasons you could almost still live there but on on the pitch would you say that time in South Africa was sort of the most enjoyable part of your career? Yeah I, I, I would say that it was um, I, f- I found another level to my game out there and, and whether whether it was because the standard maybe wasn't as good, I I'm not too sure because it's it's football so funny. You have you have games at all different levels, and and, and I've played in the Premier League, I've played in the Championship, I've played in South Africa, I've played in the Conference, um, you know, and, and and even levels below that. And you know, you can have you can have more difficult games in the lower levels of football. It's just it's it's crazy. So whether whether I don't know whether the actual overall standard wasn't as good in South Africa. Um, I'm not too sure, but I certainly enjoyed my football there. I just, I think throughout my, my career up to that point, being a left footer, you know, I was always a central player. But because when you're a left footer, you, you, you tend to get played a lot on the left side, maybe. Now, I was never blessed with a lot of pace, uh, you know, and it's something that I, maybe I felt a little bit restricted when I played on the left and, and maybe at times that's that's why a lot of my football was a bit safer because you know I would always have to have sort of pass inside or sort of go backwards because I wasn't somebody that could have beat somebody down the line and and you know and got my cross in. Um, so I think when I went out to play in South Africa, I, that I played central all the time, um, you know, and I, I I found that a lot more comfortable and I I think I thrived in that position and I think I was just suited to that game because as skillful as as African players are. I think at the time in South Africa, they maybe tactically or, you know, positionally, they weren't as aware or as, or as, as advanced as I was. And, you know, me going there, I was, I just kept my game simple and, 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 and you know, played one and two touch, which they didn't really, they hadn't really seen out there. Um, and well, I hadn't seen a lot of that sort of play out there. And, and I think in once I got fit and they, I think they really took to me, the South Africans, um, you know, and like I said, I went from strength to strength there. It's interesting hearing about taking, you know, the one-two touch football from elsewhere, bringing it into another league and being able to adapt <coughs> quite nicely in that way. You often hear about people struggling to adapt to new leagues. And sort of on that note, you you come back to the northeast of England and this is now non-league football, which is a bit of a different beast to, I would imagine, any of the football you've been playing in the Premier League in the Championship in South Africa. You mentioned that family was somewhat of a motivation to to make your way back over there what I'll just press you on it a bit because you've already spoken about it already but what what did you notice as a bit of a difference between non-league football in England and the rest of the football that you've you've played elsewhere yeah I think I think what you tend to find in non-league football is um it's very very quick but that's but that's not necessarily because it's it's direct or, or maybe it's, it's route one. It's, it's more so, I think, there is more turnovers of possession um, in non-league football, uh, you know, and, and I think players are really fit. You know, non-league football, they can run all day. They press the life out of you. Um, they make it really tough physically, uh, you know, and, and that's probably when I first came back. It's, I, again, I struggled with that pace of things, uh, you know, but then, you know, on, on the quality side, maybe... I just mentioned the turnover turnover of possession is is more frequent, um, you know. And again, when you're in a team and and you you like to be on the ball and in possession and keeping it, and and that turnover possession happens more often. Again, you you run in a lot more, and you you know you're you're sort of blowing out your arse in, in in many ways, and it's tough. Um, 
And I, I found that I found that difficult in coming back and playing in, in the conference because I said people are really fit in, in that league and and the pace of the game is 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 very very quick. So you can get if you're not up to the, the fitness levels, you can you can get caught out a lot. We've spoken about uh, family as a motivation a, a couple of times. Just in general, how important is it for any football player to feel settled where they're playing their football, regardless of how much talent you have? For instance, take someone like a, a Messi. You can assume that if he hadn't settled as well as he had, you know, he wouldn't have the career that he has. How important is feeling at home, feeling loved, and not just feeling loved by the club, but feeling happy in your own social life outside of football? Yeah, I think, you know, it's massive and probably just as important as anything else. Um, I think that in, nowadays the, the mental side of the game is and mental side of life is spoken about a lot more, um, you know, and it's, be, and it's been talked about and it's been accepted a lot more in the game. And I think that's good because, you know, footballers are like, are like any other human being. Um, yes, they get, they get paid a, sub, a substantial amount of money, um, but, you know, they, they still go through the same, the same things as, as other people. Um, and a lot of people don't realise those sacrifices. I, sp- I spent sometimes, I think, Four, four, up to four or five months without seeing my wife or, or, or you know, or my, my kids, um, you know, and and at, and at that point when I was initially there, you don't, you didn't have the social media apps and whatnot that you've got now, um, you know, so it was a little bit behind, um, so it, it was tough, uh, really, really tough, and and I think that became it became too much in the end because we had had our 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 second daughter, um, you know, and. And I, I, I basically didn't see her for, for a good nine months of her, of her life. And that all became a bit too much in the end. And, you know, that was ultimately the, the, the sort of why I, I chose to come back, come back to Gated. Um, so it plays, it plays a massive part. I mean, I, I've went into games before, you know, and, and I haven't mentally been there. Um, and I've, and, and I, it showed in my performance because, you know, maybe I, I have been missing home or missing my family or something's happened this side that I haven't been able to, you know, to be to be involved in. Um, you know, so it certainly does does play on your mind, hundred percent. That's completely understandable, and um, obviously you can see kind of after your first spell at Gateshead. Obviously, your family was still very much the priority after you had spells at South Shields and Wickham as well, which is obviously both kind of in the area. But um, at Wickham, um, you would. You would do some coaching, the first team, and of course now you're back at Gateshead and you are you are coaching um, one of the academy sides. So, do you um do you have a preference, Matty, between coaching first team players versus um, academy players, or do you just in general like coaching as a, as a, as a career? Yeah, yeah I, I really enjoy it. Um, you know, especially obviously I've it's, it's easier doing doing younger players. Um, you know, because it's you can develop them, and and you know they are they are still raw, and, and there's things to work to work with. And my, you know, my time at Wickham was was a tough one because I'd been a player there, and then sort of was thrown into that that deep end, if you like. Um, and it was something that at the time I I couldn't turn down because I wanted to do it. Um, I probably it was probably a bit too soon for me at that point of my my coaching career because. Like you said, when you're dealing with adults and dealing with men, you know, albeit a low level, you know, they've they've got opinions and it's a different dressing room. It's a it's a different level of football. Um, you know, so I, I just found it all pretty tough. And and like I said, a bit a bit probably a bit too soon for me in my career. But you know, having done that, it gave me so much um, to take away from and uh, and learn. You know, I learned a lot at that time. Um, you know, some key things and. You know experiences that that'll that'll you know I'll be able to take take into a into a say if I get a manager's job now and I'll be a lot better for it and a lot wiser for it. Um, but I would say I'm 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 enjoying doing the the academy at the moment. Um, you know that's that's something that I really enjoy. I, I like you know seeing the lads go from academy and, and into the first team setup and you know and thrive in in that environment and. You know, I'm still involved, heavily involved with it, with the Gated first team. You know, often sp- speak to with the manager and, and his assistant, and and you know, and it's 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 a really good setup we've got going at the moment. It sounds like a real uh, baptism of fire at Wickham, as you mentioned. That's probably set you in good stead for your your role at at Gateshead these days. Um, I think that is about all we 
we have time for today. So I want to thank my co-host, Joe, and then say a very special thanks to, to our guest, Matty Patterson. Uh, Matty, we hope you enjoyed being our guest. How can our listeners follow you personally? And before we let you go, can you tell us just a little bit more about a recent project of yours getting involved in Dugout Elite Performance? Yeah, um, obviously, if people can, can, can find me on Twitter at Matthew Patter um, for any, anything um, you know, football related. Yeah, and dugout was just something that um, you know, it's it's a friend of mine that does it. Uh, it's something that I've I've probably I've I've done from time to time. It's a lot of one to one stuff, uh, more specific, um, you know, individual training, which I've done quite a bit of it throughout the years. And it's something that I'm going to obviously look to do a lot more now. So that's that's what it is basically, um, you know. And it's 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 something that I enjoy and I'm passionate about. So. Looking forward to getting started again when, when we're, we're allowed to do so. Brilliant. Well, thanks again, Matty, and best of luck to you in your endeavors with Gateshead, with Dugout. Best wishes to your family as well. Um, to our listeners, if you enjoyed that, please do follow us across our social media accounts. We are at United Mates FP on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And then if you ever feel like putting some faces to these voices, check us out on YouTube. Search for United Mates Football Podcast. And now to play us out for today is our featured artist. Take it away. Football fans, what's going on? It's your boy Lazy Days, and you're now listening to the United Mates Football Podcast. Here's my new single, What Is Real? Now available to stream on your favorite streaming app. Hope you like it. Mm-hmm.